Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you, thank you for staying away from the sun and coming uh, to hear me. My name is Boaz Leskes. I'm one of the developers at Elasticsearch. And I'm going to talk today about how to use the Elasticsearch data management API and how to model your data uh, in order to make sure you keep on scaling, um, which is probably why you started using Elasticsearch to begin with. So before we can do this, um, we need to understand a bit about what are we talking about and how the what are the terminology that we have. Um, before we dive into that, I want to ask a question. How many people use Elasticsearch? Okay, challenging. How many people use Elasticsearch for logging or Twitter? Oh. Okay, way less. That's good. Good, okay. So I think the first part will be um, Familiar for most of you here, then, it seems. And that's about the terminology we use in Elasticsearch. Um, the first thing we do in Elasticsearch is what we call a document, or things you can put into Elasticsearch, or you can find them later on. And that's in Elasticsearch model this JSON. Here's a subset of a Twitter or a tweet. We can just load into Elasticsearch. And once you have a collection of those that share commonality in terms of structures, we tend to call them types. OK? Comparable with a table. If, if you don't know. Um, and then a collection of type is what Elasticsearch calls an index. An index. Okay. So an index is a set of documents or types which each have manifested manif them in multiple uh, options. So in this case, we had, um, we had our tweet itself over here with created ID and some text in it. And on the right side, we have um, a document which rep represents the author of the tweet and therefore is related, and typically these things go together, so you can query them together and uh, look at relations between them. So Elasticsearch um, is built to store data, uh, prefer preferably lots of data, although that's not required. And um, to do so, we typically take an approach that any other, many other systems uh, do, and that takes a collector of data and split it up into pieces, which is called uh, shards, which should be very intuitive. And once we have this piece of data, that means that when we have servers, we can take them and place them around. Okay, so in this case, we had two nodes, and we assigned shard one, shard two, shard three, and shard four to these two nodes. And also in Elasticsearch, we have the notion of uh, high availability. Therefore, we need to create copies of your data. So when a node goes down, we have, say, we, we lost this node, then we have a copies of the data that was on, on that node, and we and you can keep on querying. So that's the basic notion. Now with Elasticsearch, when you add more resources, Elasticsearch will take your data and balance it around. Oh, balance it around. So here we added, we, had, we started with our four nodes from before, and then we ended another four nodes, and Elasticsearch will figure out how it should be evenly distributed and copy the data to its place, to its new home. And the important thing to realize in this case, it's really about the shard. It doesn't really matter if to which index this shards belong to, so therefore you can also say, I'm storing multiple indices, indices in my Elasticsearch cluster, shard them, and these little shards also spread out and balance out in exactly the same way. So once we have these indices split into shards, split, put on the nodes, then we can look at how actually you can access the data. And this, uh, there are multiple ways of getting your data. You can get documents by ID, you can search them, you can also replace them with new content. But the most common one and more insightful one is search. And as you can see here, you can call the Elasticsearch underscore search API to query both indexes at the same time. It's not a problem. And you can do this to any node in the cluster. So you can ask any node in the cluster to serve a search request by default. And uh, if you watch the talk by Clint in the morning, you can see that this is actually doing injustice to the search mechanism. It does work, actually. And it's the easiest way to get data out if you don't care what the data is. Just get, give me something. That's, that's the easiest way, right? So you can send it to any node. So this could have been any of the above nodes. And the first, first thing that Elasticsearch does with this is to figure out where it needs to go, OK? And because we ask for both index one and both in, index two, we need to go to at least one copy of each shard to, get, to execute the search on it. And in this case, Elasticsearch have chosen to uh, use two copies, one primary copy and another copy here. So the search request is forwarded to every of the shards, and we make the search locally where the data is, and we get the answer back, combine it, and give it back to the user. Straightforward, I think. Um, 
So what is the takeaway from all of this, except for the fact that you have sharding and you balance them and all the, all the stuff we discussed? The fact is that when we need to do something with data, like searching, it's about which shards participate in that search or in that operation. And that's the shard we need to go to. It doesn't really matter how we find out what shards we need to go. Okay, and that will be useful later. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. It's much easier, also nicer. Um, clear so far? Good? Yes. So let's, with that introduction, let's go and speak about time-based time data, which is the first example. So the first thing is, what is time-based data? What do you mean by that? And when we say time-based data, the, it turns out there are lots of examples. I think the left one is very familiar. How many people know the right logo? Now oh, there you go. I thought I have another talk opp opportunity, but it seems <laughs> it's good. So when we say time-based data, I say times that ingest into a search over time, and it, over time you have more and more and more out of it. We say typically associated with timestamp, right? Hence the time-based data. And most, uh, and another important aspect of it that once the record is created, you typically don't change it. Okay? It doesn't have to be absolutely correct, but by and large, you just don't change change it, right? A tweet cannot be modified, it can be deleted, but not modified. A log is typically never ever changed once it's written to disk or sent directly wherever you want to do it. So these are the use cases we talk about. And especially for Twitter, but with logs also from other sources, it's really easy to get, especially in a JSON form. And once you have it, it's also really easy to index into Elasticsearch. You just send it over, and here's the notation of this is the index, this is the type, right, which indicates the structure of the data here. Um, or at least the fact that there is some commonality here, and we give it an ID, which is optional, and we send the document over, and Elasticsearch will scan this document, figure out that this is a date, this is an, a, a number, this is a free text talk, and some nested structure. Right? Figure all of out, you just load it in, and everything is corrected to you, you get everything indexed by default. Okay? So let's go back to sharding. So we said when Elasticsearch uh, creates an index, we shard it, split it into pieces, in this case, depicted in terms of three shards, and you can just continue indexing into it. And you index data, and you index data, right? It's time-based data, they keep on coming, you cannot stop this thing. Um, it comes up and comes up, and we go, and we go, and you go, and at some point, you have a problem. Because your shards are full. Oops, clicked. One, two, happily. So your shards are, are full, and then what can you do about that one? So in Elasticsearch, it was a, a design a choice, which we might change at some point. But currently, you, once you've started an index, you fix the number of shards that index has, and you cannot change it anymore. And the primary reason the choice was made is because if you want to change the data, basically you need to take all those gigabytes or terabytes of data, split them in two, re-index them, right? Build this inverted index in the background, move them around, and you have to do all of these things while your machine is full. Okay, so you don't have the resources to do this, and clusters tend to go down. So you basically fix to this initial choice you've made in the beginning, and therefore, in this specific case, if you do it that way, you'll get stuck. Okay? So the naive solution to say, well, I started with three, three is not too much, let's start with more. Right? Then I have more. And that's, that's actually viable solution, and, it's, and you'll go longer, uh, longer than what you did with three shards, but it also has a problem, because you'll typically put all of these things on a node, and when you start, you don't want to buy as many nodes as you have. Yes? Question back. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one quick question. When are shards full? Because um, as long as your nodes are large enough, uh, they can still accommodate the shards. Yeah, that's so a good question. So the shard can be full because there is no more space on disk. Yeah, but usually right? it's not that That's one. usually not a problem, correct. Uh, the shard typically is full because the resor other resources on the node uh, cannot serve requests fast enough mm. for the amount of data. And that can be CPU, can be memory, can be I/O throughput of the disk. It really depends on the data and the queries that you make. Okay. But at some point, that's, why, that's all the juice you can get from the server, basically. Thank you. Yeah? So if you start with more shards, exactly, you put all of these things on the same node. And all of these teams share those resources we just talked about. And so it doesn't really increase our scale. 
Even worse, the number of shards determine the level of parallelism that you can execute a single request, right? So when we make our searches, remember we choose the shards, now we need to go to all the shards and we execute all of them in parallel, and that pull node now has to do, I don't know, to use 12 of its, 11 of its cores to execute one request, okay? And probably all of those will go to disk. So that doesn't really scale, and of course you can also say, I start with more shards, and I'll start with more nodes, and then every shard is on a single node, and I can go a longer way, which is perfectly viable, but then you incur a certain cost in advance before you even have the data. Okay, so that's not, not a situation to do. So you can do many things with this model, and you can buy SSDs, and you can buy more servers, and start with more shards, and all the things, but for all of these solutions, at some point, it's gonna get stuck. And the problem is that these things, with this use case of time-based data, or the logging, the logs keep coming, and the tweets keep on being ingested, and you have to do something, you're stuck. So you want to keep up with the model with goes with your data, and scales up as you go. So how to do that? Ideally, as I said, you want to have a model that scales with your data. So we will take the, index, uh, the data that comes from March and put them in an index. And as we flow over to the next month, we'll have another index, which is a new space, which we can put the data on, and as so forth and so forth, right? And that's what we're going to work towards. So we have one index with time. Every time every time we go to a new month, we can allocate a new bucket. So effectively, that will give us a solution that scales with time. Okay? So as the data scales with time, so does your cluster scale with time. So we have two shards uh, for April. I think this one and this one. And this is the March data. And may we start it here, and you can see as we add shards, we need more resources, but you add the resources as the data comes along, not in advance. Okay, make sense? So that's good from that perspective, but it actually also helps on the search side, because now it also helps to focus your searches. Because especially, uh, typically in this kind of use cases, you only care about most recent data most of the time, and sometimes you want to go back in time, right? So before, if we would just search the entire index and all the shards with the index, we will have to query all these shards and ask what do they think, and then we'll go back and say, well, actually, I, don't have, I have a little bit of what you want and many of stuff you don't want. And if we organize things that way, we can say, if you want to have the, all the tweets from the current month, we know in advance we only need to go to these two shards. And therefore, we only, overload, only use these resources from these two nodes. So that works in that one uh, as well. Now the nicety about this is that it only takes one little change in our indexing commands. And that's this. Okay? So the only thing we need to change is the index name. Right? So here it says tweets from the January of this year. And because Elasticsearch automatically creates the indices for you, you just send this request, you just write your code to take this date, extract the month out of it, normalize it to this May, construct the request, and everything else goes on its own. Of course, you need to monitor things and buy servers on time and these kind of things, but at least for the indexing side, this goes on. So that's really simple. But there's still a couple of problems. The thing is, not all days are the same. So I went to the internet, and that's the image I found to indicate the growth. No idea if it's correct or not correct, but it does indicate typically if, if, if solution is successful, this is what you will get. You'll get more and more and more data, quicker, 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 and quicker. So also need to deal with this. And the good news is that because we create index on a daily basis or monthly basis, we can change our configuration on a daily basis or a monthly basis. So if before we, have, we were good with three shards, now we can start with 10 shards or with four shards or whatever fits your data goals. Okay? And not only that, if you have more throughput and you need more replicas, right? then you can change that as well. You're not fixed to your configuration options which you started with, which are typically not what you would like. And if you do this, you kind of kind of think, well, now I have to participate and create indices before I can index into them. And all this beauty of just taking the daytime of your tweet and creating the index name, all of this is gone. Now, for this, we have um, another API, which is called the index template, which allows you to configure indices based on their name or some other measure in advance, right? So if you do the, if you say you do the monthly, um, the monthly indices, 
and you figure out somewhere half of May that, well, you're going to make May with the number of shards that you have, but if we keep on going for June, we'll need more, right? You don't have to wait until the 31st of May, I hope I got that one correct, to midnight. Change it just on time and let the indexing go. You can actually change your template, and the template will only take into effect or kick into, uh, into action when a new index is created. So, 1st of June, whenever that happens, UTC, figure the time changes, you don't have to worry about all of that. It creates for you. And in this case, I, go, I went from four shards and kept the number of replicas at one. Okay, so this is the configuration uh, options. But if you model your data that way, you can do other things, right? And you can also take into account that when you look at time-based data, new data is more important than old data. You access it more often. So you can also maybe go back to, your, to this cluster um, scenario, right? You can say that the data will, these things are accessed more often, so maybe it makes more sense to put these on expensive machine and this one on less expensive machine, just to save on money. And it turns out that's uh, fairly easy to do because you can give Elasticsearch hints as to where to put the data. And you do that using the allocation filtering API. And first of all, you need to annotate your nodes somehow. So Elasticsearch will know what the characteristic is of those nodes. And this is arbitrary text. You can make it mean whatever you want to make it mean. And once you've uh, indicated, you can say, OK, well, you know what? All the indices from last year or from two years ago I want to get them off the SSDs, right? Exclude disk SSD, and I want to put them on the spinning disks machines. And Elasticsearch will start moving them around um, until they they got them off the machines, and then you can create new indices, etc. So that becomes also very easy. You can also say, you know what? Just moving them to machines is is nice, but I don't want to go that much. I can do other stuff with it. So here's going from top to bottom. Uh, optimization we can do. The first thing, if you take last month and you know you're not going to index into it anymore, you can do something we call optimize, which check the underlying sub-indexes that Lucene builds called segments and merge them into few. That means that they can share on the administration and take slightly less space on disk. Or you can say, well, you know what, from last year, I do want to have them around on disk, but I don't need them to be available for searches. Therefore, no memory resource, no CPU, no mistakes in queries that takes you into those domains. And that you can do with the close uh, command. And so it's just one other command called underscore open to bring them back into search. So that's why it's handy. And finally, if you really don't need the data anymore, you can just delete it. All time-based. So for all of these, to automate them a bit, we have um, a Python, little Python script called Curator, which allows you to, to make all of these commands uh, as a cron job. So it will do all the time deltas and tell you, okay, one year ago, I want to have closed. Two years ago, I want to have deleted or optimized, or what have you, and I don't need to do these commands and change my cron jobs every month or what have you. It's, it's, it's handy little scripts. So all of these things are about data administration, indexing, number of shards. But we still have the application side, which needs to, when it makes a search, need to decide which index you, um, you want to search. And typically, those decisions will not be made in, uh, I want to search May. It will typically be made in this use case. I want to search the last two weeks, or I want to search the last three months, or I want to search something relative to now. And to do those, to manage with this, we have another handy configuration option called aliases. Okay? So here's an alias, and here's a command to add an alias onto, to this index, which I should have updated the, the names, but anyway, call this index last two months, and this index also put it under the last two months alias. So now I can actually query make a search, and I didn't have an example here. Right? So now I can just put here instead of May, last two months. And Elasticsearch will figure out what it, what it means, and that one I can do another con job, say, okay, Every beginning of the month, shift the last two months' early answers to, to a couple of other indices. So that makes it simple over there as well. OK? So what do we take away from this? It's first of all that you use the indices to manage data and assign indices to time, that you can change your configuration as time moves by. And also, just to keep things simple, you can also use aliases to abstract that complexity away and keep up searching the last two months. Okay, so one last thing I want to say about this uh, time-based data, this actually doesn't have to be about time. 
So the only thing that's special about time is it's an increasing function that goes up and up and up. But anything else that has this behavior is just as good. So if you look into your primary keys in your database, because you're moving data around, you can do the same thing. They go up, it's fine. Um, and also, at some point, you can also, uh, it doesn't have to be as strict. If you go, sometimes go a little bit back, it still, it still is a good model. It's not a big, it's not, it's not a big deal. OK? Clear? Righty, so let's move on to the other use case. Uh, use data. And um, that's the scenario where you have a customer, or a, zero, or a department, or I don't know what, set of applications, and you want to store their data or their logs in your Elasticsearch cluster. But that's a fairly simple scenario. The problem becomes is what do you do when you have this? Okay, so you have like 30 of those, or 40 of those, or 1,000 of those, and you need to manage them in the right way. So the first things you can do, which is very intuitive, is say, you know what? It's very easy to create indices, right? Just create an index for everyone. And that looks like this. So we have here index number for user number one, shard one, shard two, so user two, and so forth and so forth. It's a very simple solution, very straightforward. You don't have to ask yourself which data you have to query. If you want to serve requests from user number one, you go to index named user number one. And that's very simple. But it does suffer from the very same problems that we had with time-based data if you started with too many shards. You still want to put it on limited set of resources because you don't want to, if you plan to have 1,000 users, you don't want to buy 1,000 servers in advance. Okay, you want to grow as the number of users grows. So that, that basically leads us to the same, same problem. We start with, typically with too little servers to support that amount of sharding, and that environment, and we basically overload our nodes. So the alternative would say, okay, let's go and do it differently. Because it's the same application, if it's the same application, the, the users still have similar structures, so you can represent users as types, and create one index and throw all the data into it. And then you end up in this scenario where four shards and all the data of all the users is spread out around them. This one is also doable and perfectly fine, except it is a have like time data, it has a limited horizon, because at some point you will have too many users to fit in that index. And what do you do then? So a solution we typically recommend would like to propose is to kind of have both. Okay, so I call it solution 12, which is both one and two. And that means that you take one index and you throw lots of small users into it. And then you take another index, say, oh, well, user number six actually have lots of data. I'm going to give him an entire index just for user six. And then I have index number three, and I throw all these users into it. And if I have more and more users, I just create index four, five, six, seven, eight, and therefore you get this growth model again. But this, this, this works really nice, except now it's become a bit of a pain to figure out, well, where's my data? Okay, I'm user number six. I need to have administration tables and figure out where, where did I put to this user number six, and how, how does that work from the application side? So if you contrast it to the, this is all you need to do in the first, in the first model. If I want to get the, the data from user number one, I just query the index of user number one. It's very simple. Now we lost that. So we want something that combines the simplicity of the first model and give you the scalability of the second model. That's, that's basically, or the third model, actually, to, to be honest. And to do so, we go back to our aliases. Okay? So what do we do here? We make an alias called user underscore one, and we tell it, well, take the user group underscore one, which is index number one in the slide before, right? Because we threw all these users into this one. The problem with just querying this index, which we had before, is that in this index contains data from multiple users. So if you just query it, you may return the data from user number two to user number one, and you get trouble. You get phone calls, and things are not nice. So what you can do with these alias is one of the things you can do, you, you can add a filter. And again, this is a term filter that says that all the data should have the, term, the user number one in this field, okay, in the document. And that every time that you use, you query Elasticsearch through this, a user underscore one alias, this filter will be automatically added for you. So you don't need to think and remember to do this. And now we basically took, took the scenario where we have one, two, where we have multiple users per index, and sometimes one user per index, and we put all that administration in the alias table, and to our application layer, it looks just as 
So now one user per index, and we got this one. OK? So actually, that went really fast. We went to 43 slides in, I don't know, 24 minutes. So either I was speaking way too fast, or it's super clear, but we have lots of time for questions. Yes. As Thank you very much for your talk. Mm. Yeah, if you have mm. any mm. question. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Good start in the Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, please wait for the microphone. Um, about the last slide. Yeah. Can I combine this feature with the rotation by month? So you can combine these two models? Uh, yeah, underscore template. I'm sorry, I don't hear well. The underscore template feature. Yeah. So um, that I yeah, this is, this is totally about, uh, so you can inject, um, yes, you can, but fairly recent versions of Elasticsearch. Okay, so uh, adding aliases during index creation is a recent feature. It's possible. And then once you can do it during index creation, you can also put it in templates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About uh, solution number 12, also this one. Um, what would you do if uh, the same users use the same documents with the same ID? Is it possible to also have uh, the same IDs for different users in the same index? Yeah, that, that's a problem. So in that sense, you'll need to pre prefix the ideas with your own, with your own uh, identifiers. Okay, and, and this also um, mm. means that every document has to um, have the user index name included in the document to or be able to filter out. Yeah, or some derivative thereof, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. And the back. Oh, sorry. Uh, what happens to the TF-IDF values if you split an index up into separate index indices? Yeah. So yeah, that's that's another thing to consider. Down, uh, to consider here, you actually mix them together. Okay. So, so if the, it, the assumption here is that the data is more or less similar. Okay, because the, the structure of the documents is the same, so the, also the content is different, obviously, but in terms of in statistical terms, it's similar, and those become shared, shared. But the unit in which the TF-IDF values are handled is the index, right? Yes, on a shard level, actually. On the shard level. Yeah, okay. you can change that, but by default, it's on a shard level. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, also on this slide, this doesn't prevent you from adding or uh, let's just say updating the user attribute to user underscore two, does it? To update the user? Th that, that, that user attribute, to update it to user underscore two. You mean here? Yeah. Yeah, you can query it. So no, but, uh, what I know, sorry, what I mean is like also send the, um, uh, you know, to just make changes that will eventually make it into that specific index. Yeah, no, it, it doesn't it doesn't prevent you. You have yeah. to you have to be careful to do it, but at least it gives you a very clean interface. If you keep on querying from this, right, then 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 it guarantees by Elasticsearch that this filter will be applied. Gotcha. Okay, but if you bypass it, no one stops you from doing it, then then it's up for grabs. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, over here. Please raise your hand if you put it down. I don't see you anymore. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, yeah. One more question regarding time-based sharding. So what are limits for Elasticsearch in terms of number of indexes? So I would imagine if you have 300, 300 indices, you pay extra cost for dictionary, and there are some uh, communicational costs. Yeah, so that, there's, there's multiple, multiple layers to these costs. Um, so the first thing is that if you talk about data, then the administration is kept on a shard level. Okay, so if you split your data too much, then, the, then you cannot share the administration of these data, like the, um, the tokens in the, in the in the inverted index, uh, all all other thing, memory cache, and this kind of thing. So that so that's on a data level. Um, 
So what the reason I'm saying is if you split it in terms of indices, you also implicitly guarantee that the shards will not be shared as well, and therefore you'll get this one. Then you have another layer of this, which is index management, right? So you can query every node in Elasticsearch, and it will know where to forward, you, forward the request. So that also implies it needs to know where the data lives. And there is, a, there is a theoretical upper bound there as well, right? So because that, that information needs to be passed, loaded in objects in memory and put on a node, and the node has to have mem enough memory to hold that one and potentially do some more stuff than that, that and uh, you can go. But this is compressed and dealt with, and, but there is a limit there at some point. But yeah. uh, can you give a practical idea of what you think is number of indices is reasonable? Of what, of indices? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it no all limit. depends. <laughs> but I mean, like, the number you threw around with, like, 1,000, uh, that's not a problem at all. Mm, okay. okay. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, so in this example, if you wanted to move the user one... Um, to a different char, uh, to a different index, could you just update the aliases uh, and Elasticsearch would do every, all the no. reach? No. No, okay, so, so the question is about upgrading a user, right, or moving it around. Um, that depends on the data flow for that user, primarily, because what you need to do is actually copy the data. From one, from one index to another. Uh, there are very efficient ways of doing it, but then you're kind of in a, in a race condition of like, if the user keeps mutating it, uh, the data, then, then you need to kind of solve it in an application layer. There is no support, no support for it in Elasticsearch itself. Okay? So you need to start a copy process, which you can do efficiently, um, but you need to figure out incoming data. You probably want to route it to two places. Okay, so we also have a versioning support which allows you to make sure that if you have a newer copy of the data, it will not be overwritten by an older copy of the data, and using that you can build something. Yeah, there's another question. Um, yeah, so basically this primarily applies to use cases where you can predict the load, sort of, or the size of users. Or, I mean... No, well, I mean, like, there is an upgrade path. So I'm saying it is not, you have to build in yourself, but you have all the components you need. So you can copy data efficiently. You can send indexing requests to multiple places. That's easy to do from your application, yeah. right? And if you, and you need some notion of versioning support, right, in your application. To, and then you can say, only overwrite this data if it's older than what I think it should be. And then the copying process from Elasticsearch will not, will not override it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, do you have any numbers, uh, like uh, real uh, world numbers for this logging use case? Let's say um, whatever number of nodes, memory per um, yeah. like index per day, something like application logs, whatever. Something. Um, yeah, so, so I'll answer in reverse. So most people do index per day, okay? Because that's the default uh, in Logstash. Uh, you should actually think if that makes sense for you. Um, yeah, that was my original. Yeah, I, so so these type of questions which you get a lot is there's no good answer. The answer is like depends on your hardware's data queries. Yeah, just right? if you have some numbers for some yeah, I'm, hardware. I'm, like. I'm answering in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question was about numbers. So the first advice, and that's the only good advice I can give you: measure it. Take your queries, take your servers, and try it out and see what works for you. Because anything I say right now not does not necessarily fit. That said, we know of customers that that have. Um, like petabyte of data, hundreds of nodes, thousands of indices, and, and, and it goes. Okay. Hi, I was Hi. wondering if um, all queries you can do and, and stuff with Elasticsearch uh, support filters because if you, let's say, put all your users in one index mm -hmm. and want to build an auto-suggest feature, how can you make sure that you only suggest terms that this user like entered and not over the whole index? Is it possible to filter on... That specific answer, I'm not sure, actually, if they suggest one. All the queries, the standard query DSL supports it for sure. It's also baked into the search structure. So you can say, here's a query, here's a filter. Okay, otherwise we could not do this. Yeah. Uh, what we are now referring is an, uh, suggestions and autocomplete and other things, and there I'm not 100% sure. New Coming. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, it is, it is, it's called the? Context suggestion. Context suggestion, that one works. 
Great, thanks. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. Okay. Hi. Well, this was about expanding on time, about the size or sizing of the database. Mm -hmm. um, how does the tribe mechanism tie okay. in here potentially? How does it, sorry? The tribe, so you could could use also elastic tribes? Oh, tribe nodes. Tribe okay, nodes. yeah, um, sorry. So, um, a tribe node kind of takes you a level above this, okay? So what we had, we had shards on an index level, then we had the multiple index for time, but all of these things live within a cluster, okay? And, what it, and when you query this cluster, you can query any of the indices within this cluster. But sometimes you want to have, for operational reasons or geographical reasons or what have you, you want to have all of this data in Singapore in a cluster and all of that data in New York in a cluster. Or you want to have, the user do not query anything else within the data, but I as a system administrator do want to have global statistics, right? But from operational perspective, I want to set them also in, in, in a cluster. So if I do upgrades or I do server maintenance, it doesn't effectively affect everyone, right? You can kind of compartmentalize problems in a sense. Uh, and then the tribe nodes allows you to connect to multiple clusters and then query those. Okay, so it's yet another layer on top of this. Did I answer your question? Yeah, okay, cool. We have five minutes left, so if any more questions, you're welcome. Okay. Then, thank you very much for your talk. Mm. 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 Mm.